Hello everybody, welcome to A British Audio File. For those of you who are new to this channel, my name is Taron. Today I'm taking a look at another amplifier by Atoll Electronique. Those of you who aren't familiar with Atoll, let's face it, many of you won't be, it's a small company based in France. I've reviewed one of their amplifiers before in the summer. What impressed me with the IN200 signature was that for an amplifier under £2,000, it's actually built in France. And when you take off the hood, you don't have to be an engineer to appreciate you seem to get an awful lot for the money. That's a very good sounding amplifier. I was recently contacted by the UK distributor who mentioned that actually that amplifier has now been updated and they've addressed the main criticism I had of it in the review. Now I'm not saying that they did that based on my review. I'm sure the amplifier was due for an update anyway and they took in feedback from all kinds of sources. It's nice to know that my comments were acknowledged at least. My main criticism of the IN200 signature was that it had a slight forwardness in the upper mid-range which could give it a borderline aggressive tendency with certain recordings. So interesting to see what the new one sounds like. It didn't really make sense for me to review the IN200 signature again but the UK distributor also mentioned that the IN80 signature was also updated and that's an amplifier that retails for less than a thousand pounds in standard form and he suggested that that might actually be the standout model in the range so I'm taking a look at that let's see how I got on the Atoll Iron 80 signature retails for 899 pounds in the UK it's available in a silver finish it's what I'd consider a full rack width unit weighing 7 kgs or 15.4 pounds. There's a black finish available as well. Both units can have an optional phono stage fitted for 140 pounds or an AKM based DAC for 259 pounds. It is substantially built with a thick aluminium front plate, steel chassis, all metal casework and all the knobs and buttons are aluminium as well. Press the button on the right to take the amplifier out of standby. The adjacent buttons will toggle between analog inputs. Cleverly, you just press the two buttons simultaneously to access the digital inputs, assuming the DAC is fitted. It helps to keep the button count down and maintain a clean aesthetic. The volume control is smooth with a nice resistance. There's a 6.25 quarter inch headphone jack and the 80 signature comes with Atoll's multi-purpose remote control. This unit doesn't have the optional phono stage, so there's just RCA line level inputs labelled auxiliary, CD, tuner and DVD, a tape loop to connect to recording devices and a fixed input for home theatre bypass, two sets of pre-outs to connect to external power amps and or active subwoofers, the gold plated speaker terminals are good quality and the 12 volt trigger will allow you to synchronise control to Atoll's range of power amplifiers. You have all the digital inputs that most people will require with two coaxial, two optical and one USB asynchronous connection. I've turned the unit on its side so we can see a little bit more clearly what's going on from this angle. What we have is a relatively large toroidal transformer for an amplifier around this price, rated at 340 VA. Those four black heat sinks have the output transistors mounted to them. They're by American company Vichay, which is well respected. They're MOSFET transistors, there's two per side. And MOSFETs have a reputation of sounding a little bit warmer than the bipolar junction transistors you commonly find on amplifiers around this price. Those are the power supply filter caps. Again, four of them, two per side. By another well-respected manufacturer, this time Nippon from Japan. You can make out there, each one is rated at 6,800 microfarads. So that's 13,600 microfarads per side, 27,200 in total. Nothing particularly elaborate about that, but it's good quality parts. That's the power amplifier section. You have an identical module for the left and right sides, nicely separated, which is nice to see. And what's worth noting here, it's a fully discrete design, which means you've got no chips, no ICs, and also no surface mount tiny little parts. It's all through hole parts, which are generally considered better from a sound quality perspective. There's also those two white caps at the front, 
by Vichet as well. And they've probably used a higher quality part there because I should imagine those caps are probably in the signal path, probably decoupling capacitors, dealing with the DC coming in from the input side, the preamp section. And there's not much of a preamp that I can see. There are these four little transistors here, which could be part of the preamp section. So there might be a little bit of gain here. And then you have the Alps motorized volume control. It's an analog volume control, decent quality part. So it's possible that this could have a passive preamp section, which is the case with the exposure 2510. And you can get away with that with amplifiers with modest power. This is rated at 80 watts into eight ohms and 120 watts into four ohms. Got plenty of open loop gain to play with, so passive preamp is possible. Over this side, we have the ICs here, which I should imagine are part of system control. And these black rectangular devices here, close to where the inputs are connected, are relays to switch between the inputs. You have the digital section on this board mounted on the top. That's the DAC board effectively. And you can make out the XMOS chip, which deals with the USB interface. I did check out these ICs here a little bit earlier. If I can just point to it, that is the AKM DAC chip, the 4490. So it's a very nicely laid out, well built unit with good quality parts, more than what you'd normally expect to see. And it's built in the Normandy factory in France as opposed to built in China. And the build quality that I've come to expect from Atoll. Let's get down to brass tacks. Does the Iron 80 signature sound anything like the Iron 200 signature that I reviewed a few months ago? Well, let me just remind you very quickly about the overall sonic character of the 200. It was a fast dynamic amplifier with tight agile bass, a little bit of leanness in the lower mid-range, a little bit of forwardness in the upper mid-range and high frequencies, which gave it a cool overall tonal balance. That forward nature gave you an intimate listening experience, but it lacked soundstage depth. It wasn't the greatest in terms of soundstage width either. So what about the Iron 80 signature? Well, apart from it also being very dynamic, it sounds nothing like the Iron 200 signature. I think that sound staging is now its standout feature. Forget the £1,000 category, in the sub £2,000 category, I don't think I've come across another amplifier that has a sound stage as wide and as deep as this. I'm talking about solid state amplifiers, not tube amplifiers, that wouldn't be fair. Imaging is very good. Not only can you clearly make out the location of instruments within the sound stage, there's very little blending from one instrument to the other, even with relatively complex passages of music. It's not the last word in clarity though. Those leading edges of notes are softened a touch, but the decays are simply glorious and that's because the background is inky black. High frequencies are a little curtailed. And again, this is another reason why that lack of expression on top robs it a little bit of ultimate clarity. The mid range is another significant departure from the Iron 200 signature that I reviewed. It's full rich, dare I say even lush sounding, Romanticized, embellished for sure, but who cares? In fact, some of you are gonna care. The point I'm trying to make is that with simple acoustic music, vocals, small jazz quartets, trios, for example, it sounds simply glorious. In many ways, it reminds me of the Sugden A21 Class A amplifier that I reviewed that's over twice the price. I'm not saying it sounds the same, it just has a very similar sonic presentation. The bass is weighty with a healthy dose of dynamic punch. It's not the last word in definition and agility. So again, this is a characteristic that I'd say it shares more closely with the Sugden A21 than the previous incarnation of its big brother, the IN200 signature. So let's talk about comparisons that I actually had to hand. Believe it or not, the Wilsington R8, despite being a tube amplifier, has an even more muscular presentation and a similar sense of scale. The bass hits harder and is cleaner more neutral through the mid-range and has more extension on top which gives it a more balanced presentation but it can't match the iron 80 signature in terms of refinement i spent quite a bit of time doing a b comparisons with the excellent exposure 2510 despite the fact that the exposure is almost double the price as a straight amplifier i just wanted to see what extra you got for your money and in terms of dynamics and overall scale 
I'm talking about the size of the soundstage, the Atoll is actually slightly better. It makes sense, it's got more power, but in every other regard, the exposure highlights why you'd spend the extra. It has an agility, a lightness of touch that the Atoll can't quite match, and also it has a much more neutral tonality, which makes it more suitable to use with a wider range of music. For example, rock music, where you want a little bit of bite and excitement. The Atoll comes across as a little bit too polite. Overall, the top end extension and the clarity is also better on the exposure, but it is an awful lot more money as well. There's not much to talk about in terms of setup because the Atoll Iron 80 signature is an integrated amplifier and it's pretty much plug and play, but it does come with a couple of optional features that are worth discussing in a little bit more detail. One is the optional phono stage that retails for £140 seems more than reasonable for turntable users. The other is the optional DAC that's based around the AK4490 chip that retails for £259. That's actually what I had in my unit. And I have to say, I commend Atoll for their approach and I wish more manufacturers would do this where you only pay for the features you actually want. The other thing I'd like to say is that the DAC inside this unit is absolutely excellent. Just to give you some context, I did A-B comparisons with the Denifrips Pontus 2 DAC. That's a DAC that retails for £2,000 that I have here for review. When I was doing A-B comparisons between the two DACs, I didn't notice that much difference. Sure, the Denifrips sounds a little cleaner and a little bit more open sounding. That's only because I had them here both at the same time and I was able to do that A-B comparison. I'm not saying that the Denifrips isn't worth the money. In the right system, it absolutely is. What I'm saying is, it's the character of the amplifier that ultimately shone through and the internal AKM DAC does not place a limit in terms of the performance on the amplifier. So let's talk about speakers. My Proc Response 1 SCs have caused many an amplifier around this price to come unstuck, either by revealing shortcomings in their mid-range performance or their ability to deal with a changing load. They seem to favour amplifiers with power, real power, not just empty watts, where it's backed up with a stiff power supply. It's not just that the Atoll drove my Proax well, it did. It also has a richness and a fullness in the mid-range that the Proax were able to reveal. In fact, I'd go as far as to say it's one of the few amplifiers around this price that you could live with with the Proax. The Amphion Argon ones that I have here on long-term loan are an excellent speaker, clean, dynamic, with only the leanness in the mid-range an indication of their price. It's the opposite of my Proax in some ways. It's a relatively easy to drive speaker, which works well with a wide range of amplifiers. Didn't work with this at all though. I'm not quite sure what the problem is. Sometimes you get two very good components that simply don't work together. I suspect it's something to do with the fact that the Atoll has a little bit of thickness in the mid-range and a little bit rolled off on top, whereas the Amphion's all about speed and expression. The two together sounded lifeless. See those speakers on the stands behind me? Those are the new JBL L52 Classics that retail for a thousand pounds. I'm not gonna to say too much about them at this stage because you're gonna to have to wait for the review, but that's an energetic speaker. And I don't mean that as some kind of criticism. It just means that they've got a little bit of life about them and they're quite dynamic. And they balance the sound of the Atoll quite nicely. Two together made a very nice combination. The Atoll Iron 80 Signature is an attractive looking amplifier with the kind of build quality that you wish for at this price point, but seldomly get. Sonically, not only is it very good sounding in almost every regard, in a lot of those areas it knocks the ball out of the park showing other manufacturers where to go. It has a big, wide, deep sound stage, it's dynamic, and it has that warm, lush, mid-range presentation that you'd associate with a Class A Sugden, but just for a fraction of the price. It's not perfect though. When Atoll were trying to tame that forward nature, I think they went a little bit too far, which means that it won't pair that well with every type of speaker, and it's not suited to every genre of music. Rock fans, you should look elsewhere. You may think it deserves an outstanding award, and I don't argue that logic, but my outstanding awards are awarded to those products that I think are the go-to at their particular price. Unfortunately, the Atoll Iron 80 Signature has a little bit too much sonic coloration for that. But if you're looking at an amplifier around this price and you think this might be your thing, you overlook this at your peril. It's as highly recommended as I can possibly state. So that's it for me in my review of the Atoll Iron 80 Signature. Just before I go, 
do share in the comments section what type of sound character are you like? Do you like something that's fairly neutral, that works with a wide range of music, something that's a bit more lively and exciting, or something that's a little bit warm on the rich side like this at all that I just reviewed? All that remains for me to say is please do that social media stuff. If you like this video, hit that like button, share it. And if you'd like to see this channel grow and you haven't subscribed already, do consider subscribing and do hit that bell notification so you know when new videos arrive. Check me out on Patreon as well for my consultancy services and also to join the ABA club where you get access to Patreon only content as well as the opportunity to chat to me face to face on our video meetings. But for today, for now, the British Audiophile signing off. Thank <laughs> you.